welcome to To Grow Good, a podcast of conversion stories, to share encounters with the living God, to bear good fruit, a place where others can meet or be inspired to meet God. So get cozy, lean in, and listen close. Miracles are at work, and He wants to meet you too. My name is Rachel Smith, and I'm your host. Now let's start growing some good. Hi, friend, and welcome to another episode of To Grow Good. I hope you have had just a fantastic week. You've been soaking up everything that summer has to offer. It's just such a beautiful time to just be outside and be with friends and family and just take it easy. I've really been feeling my word of the year rest lately. It's been so nice to just, I feel like I've entered into summer in just a new way this year that I I had never entered in that way before. Um, the Lord's really inviting me to yeah, just rest at such a deeper level, like a soul level. Um, And I hope that you are experiencing that at some level as well this season. I am so excited to be bringing you an amazing journey to the Lord tonight um, by someone who has actually impacted my own journey to the Lord. Um, And those are usually my favorite ones because they're so near and dear to my own heart and my own conversion journey. And so then to now being able, now being able to actually sit down with people that impacted my own journey is just so the Lord and so full circle. And it's just a beautiful thing. Um, But before we get to this week's guest, I wanted to share a couple exciting updates The first being that we have a new supporter of the show um, and a new partner. So if you're looking for a way to support to grow good, you can now support it in a new way. Um, So Remnant Tees has a line of t-shirts that are pro-life. And so as Catholics, we are pro-life from the moment of conception all the way till natural death. And I want to support the cause um, and raise awareness for the pro-life message. And what a beautiful way to do it through your clothing and the things that you choose to wear while you're walking out in the world. Um, And so you can now go to remnanttees.com and use grow good, the code grow good at checkout, and you'll get 20% off your order. And there's a whole line of life wins t-shirts and they're just beautiful t-shirts that have pro-life images and messages on them. Um, And they're really great conversation starters. Here's mine. You can get your own at remnanttees.com. And yeah, it's just a beautiful way to spread the word for the message and maybe strike up some conversations with people that maybe are curious and want to learn more about the dignity of human life and how it begins in the womb. So head on over to remnanttees.com. The link is also in today's episode description and use code GROWGOOD at checkout to get 20% off your order. Also, I love coffee. I don't know if you love coffee as much as I do. I use coffee every morning in my prayer time. Um, I typically, especially now that it's summer, I sit out on my front porch, which I love, And I just have scripture and my iced coffee and I start my mornings and it's just so beautiful. And it's become even more beautiful since I've been introduced to Catholic Coffee. So Catholic Coffee is um, a coffee brand that is authentically Catholic and their goal is to raise awareness for the communion of saints, which is so beautiful with every roast Um, Every roast is named after a different saint and comes with like a prayer card or just information about the saint, which I think is just a beautiful way to raise awareness for the saints and also help people learn more about their stories while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee, which nothing is better. I, in my opinion, it is up there on the list of beautiful things that the Lord has given us. And so the other good thing I love about Catholic coffee is that it's all 
roasted, created, ethically sourced here in the United States of America, which is just really awesome that they um, have made the effort to do that. And so you can go to catholiccoffee.com and use code GROW for 15% off your order of any of their roasts. So if you're going to be buying coffee, you might as well support a Catholic brand that is working to raise awareness for the community of saints um, and support this yeah, mission while you're at it. So head on over to catholiccoffee.com and use code GROW at checkout. All right, friends, those are my main updates for you. Uh, if you haven't yet already, if you're new here, hit subscribe, hop onto our email list, and you will receive um, updates every time there's a new episode. You will also receive a monthly newsletter where I share some of my favorite content and resources that I used on my own conversion home to the church and that are also still feeding me today, just episodes or podcasts or videos or books that I love as I continue to grow in my relationship with Jesus and his church. And then weekly, there's a little community of women that write uh, reflections on each gospel, uh, on the Sunday gospel. And so you could receive those for free every Sunday morning right to your inbox. Just head on over to togrowgood.com and join our email list. Okay, I think those are all my updates this week. That was kind of a lot this week, so hopefully you got through that okay. Um, and now let's get on to our conversion journey. This week, we have Nell O'Leary, the managing editor of Blessed Is She, joining us, which I'm so excited about to share her story of how she came to know that God was real and how he led her into his church. Nell is a wife, a mother, and also working full-time at Blessed Is She, which is so beautiful, just the mission and the impact that she is making on the world in all of her vocations and, and callings that the Lord has called her to. Um, so I can't wait to get to know her better and just hear her story. So let's welcome Nell on board. Nell, hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. It is so great to have you here. Thank you for saying yes to sharing your journey and oh just gosh. being here with us tonight. How could you say no to this invitation? Come on. I know, right? You just get to talk about the Lord, which is like the best. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Could you just start us out by, for anyone who may not be familiar with you or Blessed Is She, just sharing a little bit about who you are and what you do right now? Yes. So as you said, I'm a wife and mom, got five kiddos. I live in the greatest state in the union. Sorry, guys. It is Minnesota, despite the harsh <laughs> winters. It is us. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I've worked with Jenna Gizar and Beth Davis and the ladies at Blessed She since the very beginning, almost eight years ago. Uh, I'm a retired attorney or a recovering attorney. Depends on which way you want to look at it. And I absolutely love my work helping with the devotional writing, all of our books, products, resources for Catholic women through Blessed Is She. That's amazing. I, I did not even realize you were there from the very beginning eight How years lucky. ago. That's so lucky. Such a blessing. Yes. Because yeah. to watch it just continue to expand and develop. I mean, it's just so beautiful to watch. And it's so it feels so organic and like yeah. spirit led, you know, even from yeah. – from just yes. looking at it. So I it love is. to see. I just feel like that with so many ministries, it's so beautiful to see how the Lord just continues to develop it as it grows and expands mm -hmm. and takes on new life in different ways, which, yeah, that must be so just amazing to be part of. Um, and yeah, I I remember seeing that in your um, description about being a recovering attorney. So I can't wait to get into just, yeah, that whole journey of how you got into that and then how like coming out of that, I'm sure that would have been just a huge yeah transition um, because I have known a couple of lawyers and attorneys and it does, it like has a tendency to take over your whole life. I don't know if that's how, what your experience was like at all, um, but we can get into that as we get into your your journey. Um, before we do, I just want to let everyone know that might be tuning in live that you can ask questions or make comments or whatever you want in the chat, the live chat. And at the end, we'll take any questions in there for Nell and 
we'll answer them as best as we can. And Nell will share more details if she'd like about her journey. Um, so feel free to ask any questions throughout our conversation. Thanks for being here and watching. All right, Nell. So could you just um, maybe bring us back to the beginning and share a little bit about what growing up was like for you and what your relationship with God was like while you were growing up, whether you were brought up in any sort of religious household or um, if you really came to know God at any level. Um, and then if you can remember a moment when it all started to become real for you, when you realized that oh, I think he's actually there, you know, listening and wanting to be part of my life. Gosh, the very beginning. Well, I was born at a very young age. And um, well, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the fourth of five and cradle Catholic. Grew up in a beautiful traditional church that somehow had survived some of the crazy stuff that came out of Vatican II and just still had a really reverent, lovely mass. And I think the, the going to church was a big part of our life growing up. So my dad chanted in the Gregorian chant group and he'd haul us to confession once a month. And, you know, weekly mass was certainly, there, there's no wiggle room. You're always at like bottom in the pew next to your sibling, whether they're pinching your bottom or not, you were next to your sibling in the pew. And it wasn't until I went to a, a non-Catholic, I just went to a, a, a college prep high school that I realized, wow, my family's kind of weird. We're, we're pretty different. There's five of us, first of all, which always blew people's minds. Like, five? How did this happen? Like, well, my parents, five, yes, they kept going. They kept having kids. So, and starting, you know, in those adolescent years of, of hearing in like world history class about Christianity or Catholicism and thinking, gosh, that's not quite accurate or Actually, I, I need to raise my hand in this super awkward stage of being a teen and correct the teacher and say, actually, Catholics don't worship Mary. Or actually, we do believe this about the Pope. And just starting those seeds of realizing my life can't just be telling people that I believe this stuff. I have to actually live this stuff. So if they see me making poor choices at a party or they hear me gossiping about friends or being a poor sport in, you know, my athletics, that actually cuts against this thing that I'm already, I'm already different. I already come from this big family, Ash Wednesday, and everyone's like, you have dirt on your forehead. You're like, that's it's a thing. It's Ash Wednesday. <laughs> um, but to realize it's integration, it can't just be intellectual. It has to actually be something I want to show. I want to look my, I want my life to live as uh, all these teachings of the church are great on paper, but if I'm not living them, then it's not, it doesn't really mean much, you know? So those teen years were really a sense of learning and kind of navigating that with my siblings. Like, guys, we're, 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 we're weird. We stand out. How do we live this faith out in an authentic way without being a jerk to people who think something totally different than us, to be respectful and loving and kind, but also to say, this is what we believe. And it, it wasn't until actually grad school. So college was navigating that again. I went to the University of Minnesota, got my undergrad in English. Again, the only Catholic I knew all throughout. I think at one point I walked into the Newman Center and then, ooh, yikes, turned around and walked right back out. This is the early 2000s. It wasn't a, it wasn't a great environment <laughs> for Catholics. So just trying to kind of cling to my faith, but, mm. but going to it, I went to a Catholic law school and all of a sudden realizing like this is this is a relationship. This isn't just an intellectual endeavor or uh, being countercultural um, or you know trying to be kind and charitable. This is actually a vulnerable, deep need that God fills individually, personally, specifically for me, because I cannot get through this life without Him. Mm. So I, I had a devastating breakup my first year of law school and. I remember praying, uh, praying in the chapel and looking at the crucifix and thinking like, th this is it. I I'm so heartbroken. There are all these sticky circumstances and I, I can't, out I can't outthink this or analyze it or even process with all my girlfriends, come up with a game plan. Like I, I just have to totally surrender, Lord. You have to fix it kind of angrily. Like you got to fix this and not fix it like the relationship, but fix it like help me figure out who I am. Mm. 
Yeah. I'm just not what I do and I'm not who I'm dating. I'm not what I look like and I'm not whether or not I get this clerkship after law school. I'm not whether or not I get picked for the larvae. Like I just can't be all these external things anymore. I just have to be yours. And that's really unknown and really scary and really raw. And I think just being able to turn him and say like, all right, I tried everything else. None of it worked. I'm turning to you. You got to help me figure this out. Yeah. As a young adult, a 20, 23, 20, 22, 23, just seen this is the beginning of something different. It's the beginning of a relationship in my faith life that looks differently than simply going to mass and praying my rosary, which are wonderful, important things. Or, or being able to talk about Thomas Aquinas. That's great. But to truly have this conversion, like, like you love to explore here on your beautiful podcast, was a, a big eye opener for me. Yeah, that is so powerful. And I can relate to that so much. Even now, you know, like I think it's just something we continually do. We just have to keep giving ourselves to him and being like, make sense of this, Lord. Because <laughs> so often I think life just, yeah, it will, it has a way of, I think, exposing us and exposing the places that we need to surrender. Mm -hmm. And he has a way of doing that, I think, too, for us so that we become aware of how we can do nothing apart from him. Yeah. But it takes each one of us like just that's one of the things I love about hearing people's stories is it just takes each one of us. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, you froze. And I was like, I'm still no. here. You hear me like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Could you hear me? You couldn't hear me either? I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. Oh, no, that's okay. Sure you said the most profound thing in the history of the world and I missed it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Dang, it was good too. Let <sighs> me tell you. I wonder if the audio picked it up or not. We'll have to see at the end. But either way, 
I think I was saying it sounds like, yeah, the Lord took you to this point of just raw surrender. And that point is different for each one of us, which is one of the things I love to hear in conversion stories is just like, what, what was that point where you began to surrender? Because you felt like you were at the end of your, your own rope. You know, I can't do this anymore, Lord. I just need you to show me the way. And it sounds like up until that point, it had been like the seed had been rooted in in your heart, but Mm. there, it almost sounded like there was part of you that was intellectually driven or like you were doing the things you knew that you should be doing and that you were different than others because of the Lord and because of your faith. But it was this moment where it really became real in a sense for your actual Mm. life going forward. Like, and, and you as Nell versus just like, the faith as this like enigma thing. Is that, is that right? Yes. And also the self-reliance of, I love you, God. You're so great. You know, I had many wonderful moments as a young adult, uh, you know, in adoration and prayer and I'm like, that's great, God, but I'm actually fine on my own. So you're a bonus to this great life, but I I kind of, even in hard times, it didn't occur to me to totally surrender because I always kind of managed to get out of it or figure it out or, you know, kind of, slink my way out of it or, you know, think my way out of it. But that utter, that utter, utter dependence or the recognition of the reality of the utter dependence was um, a turning point for my, my spiritual maturity. And then blessed is she, a number of years later, was another big turning, turning point for me as well. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I would love to hear just like from that moment, because I think sometimes too, and sometimes it does happen that we, we have this moment of surrender And things immediately start changing or just like Mm. the Lord just begins to take over. And I've seen that in people's stories like, but then also there's this really gradual journey where small, subtle things begin to change, but it's over time that the Lord is really revealing different things to you. And so what was, what happened from that moment of surrender on? I was so blessed to meet my now husband a year later after that trauma breakup, trauma, <laughs> trauma. Um, to you know, I had I had a whole year to do some good self work and and identity work and and you know plumbing the depths of whatnot. Um, and then met my my now husband. Finished law school is a very intense experience, so I didn't have a lot of time for spiritual introspection. Mostly just. Getting, getting through law school and doing all the things. And I, I did have a federal clerkship. So I was engaged and and knew right away my, there's something different about my husband. He has a profound spirituality and it's not something that he talked about or self-professed, but just simply truly lives and still does. Gosh, we've known each other 15 years, 16 years. All these years later, just has a, a really profound spirituality, really profound relationship with God. But I don't think I even really recognized the depth of that because, you know, you only see at your own level, like mm. where you are is what your your capacity is for comprehension. Yeah. So got married, started having kiddos. Um, by the time we had our third kid, our oldest, <clears throat> excuse me, we had three kids and the oldest wasn't four yet. So three kids in three years. Boy, was I feeling it. That's, that was pretty brutal for anyone out there who's also had children close in succession. <laughs> it was pretty hard. <laughs> And I, I had stopped working at that point and was blogging and, and <clears throat> excuse me, it was actually a, a friend from law school had connected me with another blogging mom here in Minnesota. And she'd added me to this Facebook group for Catholic women who blogged. And at one, one point, the, a woman I had never heard of before, I didn't even know she was the founder of the Facebook group, put out there, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing with Catholic women, writing reflections on scripture. Would anyone be interested in helping and I, I think I like fell over my chair to respond as fast as I could on my phone while there's like one child nursing two dangling off my body. Me, me, <laughs> let me help me, please. I'm actually qualified for this. I editor of Law Review, like I managed that. I did like all these literary publications and undergrad. Like, I would I would love to be part of something where I get to use my brain, but it's also just super flex. And you know, everyone was a volunteer force for many years. So it's just something to help and and be part of. And I didn't know at the time that my own spiritual life would change. I just really thought of it in terms of, oh, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm good at editing. I'm good at managing teams. I, I can help out logistically. 
Uh, I don't know about like spirit fingers. Not really my thing. Like ministry sounds a little touchy feely for me, like this intellectual Catholic still and too intellectual over here. But <laughs> little did I know, like a couple years later, I'd be at a blessed she retreat, like praising, crying, you know, the whole thing. Mm. But to see how much the regular exposure to the sacred word through scripture, because our, our devotions, for anyone who doesn't know, we have a 40-woman writing team who writes free daily reflections on the readings for the day. So the lectionary, the mass readings, slip it into the inbox of uh, over 100,000 women at this point, which is so beautiful. Wow. And women from all ages, stages, we have, you know, grandmas, college, college gals, Dominicans, the whole, the whole gambit. But gosh, when I spent so much time editing their work, reading over sacred scripture, I didn't realize that when you soak in the scriptures, God starts working in your life, mysterious ways, starts softening your heart, changing how I viewed others. My, my judgmentalism, my rigidity really started to soften. You hear people's stories. I think story is just the most powerful thing we have. It's also the only thing. We just have our story. We don't have our health. We don't have control over our finances. We don't have control over when we're going to die. But we do have our story. To share our story and see how God's working in our lives is one of the most incredible privileges to work with women, to help them birth their stories, put their story in the world. So over time, I started to notice, gosh, I'm, I'm so much less quick to judge and Gosh, when, when I'm tempted to do like some psychoanalysis slash gossip, I'm I'm not. I'm not entering into that. And and I don't I don't want to just watch Netflix at night. When Anthony's praying evening prayer, I, I actually want to pray it with him and realizing too, as our kids got older, like I'm spending this portion of time away from my family to help share the gospel. And if if it's not changing my life, what am I doing? Mm. Like, what example am I giving to my kids if I'm just over here? for the uh, looking for an italicized comma. Like if this isn't changing me and I'm not letting God change me through this work, then I'm just spending time away from my kids for no reason. So how can I include them and how is this part of our family? And it's been beautiful to see many, many changes and just a softening of hearts and all the incredible work the Lord's done through it. Wow. That is so powerful and beautiful. And I just love how throughout your story, you're kind of describing – things that you weren't even aware of that God was making you aware of, which I think is just so beautiful because we even like to over control our own spiritual progress or our own spiritual journey. You know, it's like, oh, I'll just do this and then I'll like progress to this level or something. Like we tell we tell ourselves this yes. makes sense because if everything in the world is telling us that. So then we obviously apply that to our spiritual life. But I just love how time and time again, the Lord just has a way of giving us things like this Facebook group of women and this one other woman who just posted, hey, does anyone want to be involved and revealed this deep desire that you had to mm. be part of that. And through that desire, he was able to answer and provide things that you needed to, yes. to get closer to him, but you didn't even know, you know, he, it's such a beautiful example of like the scripture that like he knows what we need before we even ask. We don't even know what to ask for sometimes. He just <laughs> brings us there yes. and, and has us go through it. And I love to hear that too, because I think it's so fortifying in my own life. You know, it's like, oh, right. Like I don't have all the answers. He is already providing what I need next in this season. And that's why I think sometimes we feel so out of place in our lives because he's really revealing what we need more of or where, what, you know, how we can grow closer to him, which is this like purification process, but also this beautiful mm -hmm. coming to know him at the same time. Um, and I love how you've described that throughout your whole journey. It's like he was kind of paving this way for you to grow closer to him um, mm. before you even knew what to ask for or how to ask for that. Um, but I had a couple questions just about, so attorney, so you became, yes. <laughs> you graduated law school and became an attorney for a time. What was that yes. like on your, on your spiritual journey? And, um, mm. and then what was it that made you come out of that? I'm mm. so curious to know. 
So I clerked for a federal judge out in Las Vegas, which if anyone's been wow. to Vegas, it's a wild place. Wow. And it's even yes. wilder to work there, like to put on a suit every day and to go into the federal building, like where the senators are in the federal appellate court and the, and the magistrates. And then I was for a district court attorney. You drive past like the casinos and people sleeping on the sidewalk and like all this craziness. And then you get to your like guarded compound parking lot. You go in this big building and then you think, 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 think all day. It was a one-year clerkship, and I, I found that um, spiritually there's a lot of aridity in it just because you're thinking really hard, but it's like it's not – especially that particular job, there wasn't – there was very little movement in my heart for like compassion and, and love and like seeing the other person. It was very much like how do you solve this problem? How do you make a recommendation to the judge? How do you um, like put – how do you piece these things together? And then coming back to Minnesota, I worked in the district attorney's office, just saw a lot of like drug cases, traffic cases, custody, child support pretty basic stuff. And again, just felt this hardening of my heart. Like people make a lot of dumb choices and I'm the one seeing the dumb choices they make. And I'm the one metting out like what the system says about your dumb choices. Mm. And I do think, gosh, if we hadn't been expecting our first, just a couple months into marriage. And if I'd stayed this path of, I, I loved, I love being a prosecutor. I wanted to be a federal level prosecutor. I thought it was fantastic. I love being in court. I really loved, um, like, I loved the oral argument. I loved the articulation. I loved, like, the, the dramatic. I did a lot of drama in high school. <laughs> like, I loved the, the drama of being in court. All those Perry Mason movies really channeling my inner Perry Mason. <laughs> but my goodness, how um, how many friends of mine I saw who continued on that path, and it just really hardened their hearts. I, I don't know a better way to say it. You're dealing mm -hmm. a day in, day out with difficult things, uh, especially when it gets to like criminal sexual conduct cases, like hard stuff. And I think I would be, I laugh a lot because my husband's also an attorney. I say like, wow, if I, if I had continued to practice or if we hadn't been blessed with children early on and, and discern like, gosh, we can't both be lawyers who are working crazy hours. Who wants to stay home? It's like, I'm probably going to breastfeed. So I'll be the one to stay home. Yeah. Um, just to see, uh, I would not be as as nurturing and kind as I am. And that's not to say there's lots of female attorneys who are nurturing and kind. They're great moms. But for me personally, I think there's something that had to be broken down mm. by our Lord in the humility of motherhood, in the unseen. There is literally no one telling you you did a good job. It's you and this baby alone. I, I'm really sick in my pregnancies and then having kids close in the succession. It was like, I'm either throwing up or they're throwing up or someone's having a bodily fluid coming out of them at some point probably on me and there's there's it's the antithesis of being in court right? like wearing your cute suit up there looking all sassy talking to the judge explaining advocating like now you're wearing your husband's oversized t-shirt and you haven't bathed and you don't know the last time you washed your hair and there's no one bringing you a coffee and there's nothing exciting other than like pouring into these incredible beautiful little souls but i had to learn uh that again my identity wasn't what i was doing that I had this opportunity to, to be a mom and have the flexibility to be at home with them. And what an incredible gift that was. And no, nope, there's no outside affirmation. So my love language of verbal affirmation is like, Nier. especially when children, they can't even talk like Nier. no, no <laughs> affirmation. But again, like this is what our Lord's calling me to. This is where he wants me to grow in holiness, these actual circumstances. So I'm very grateful that I didn't get deeper in my career as an attorney because I think it would have been much harder to leave behind. Yeah. And instead, I spent a lot of those early hidden years just working really hard to stay cheerful and not trip over myself to say, like, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but I'm also an attorney. Like, I'm also – I'm extremely well-educated. I, yeah. I, I look more important than I do. And you recognize this is, for me, the most important thing is being their mom and to actually get that rightly ordered in my mind. And again, this identity and, and, you know, identity is a big theme in my life of I am, I am God's daughter. That is my identity. I'm not, it's not because I'm a lawyer or it's not even that I'm a mom. Like what a gift to have this time. But ultimately my identity doesn't come from what I do or how I do it, it comes from him. I need to learn mm -hmm. that lesson over and over again, Rachel. It's like God's mm -hmm. like, let's put her on the loop again. Get in that hamster wheel. Nell's, Nell's oh, the pride, the vanity. It's creeping up. Let's get her back on that. Yes. Bring her, bring her back down to reality.
That's so good. Yes. Oh, thank you for just describing that. Cause yeah, I think that it's so relatable in so many different fields or jobs or idols that we have in our lives. And yeah, just, I, I love how you described how motherhood was what the Lord invited you to in that season to just like totally strip that from your heart, you know, it in a way that was probably painful in a lot of ways at first, you know, because you're really coming up against, you know, your dependency, like we've been talking about on him yes. and yes. what we've been putting our comfort in other than him. Mm. And so, oh, that is so beautiful how you describe that. And in so many people's stories, it's, it is their vocation, you know, their vocation of motherhood and marriage that helps them to come to know that. Um, that their identity is in Christ. And it makes sense yeah. that it's through those things that God's able to work in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and another just small detail, but so when you met your husband, he was already Catholic? Yes, he's okay. also a cradle Catholic, yes. Interesting. Okay. That's beautiful too, just how you described how you were able to, I don't know, explore his spirituality as you guys grew in your marriage and how it sounds like he's really had an impact on your spiritual life. And I'm sure you have on his as well. So just a beautiful um, just story of vocation in your in your life as well. Um, but yes, moving on. So to blessed is she. That sounds incredible just that you were able to bring all these gifts that, that God had already given you in your journey and then apply them in this way where you were being just, you were in a place where you were taking in the scriptures naturally and it was molding and shaping your heart and softening your heart. Um, and you kind of had a second or a third or however many conversion yes, deeper yes. into God through blessed is she. Mm -hmm. And so do you want to just share, yeah, about what you do now at Blessed Is She and what kind of projects that you guys work on? Mm. Um, I know you have this new book, Made New, a 52-week devotional that recently has come out. And so if you want to just share a little bit about what goes into the products that you make and what your role is in putting them into the world. Absolutely. So actually, I have a copy of Made New right here, and it doesn't have oh, too yes, many grease lady. stains on it, guys, which is <laughs> miraculous. So there's a little gold foil, plus she made new 50 devo 52 devotions for Catholic women. So we we put out lots of lots of experiences and then lots of books. So the the bevy of our of our uh, of our offerings span from like an in-person retreat all the way to the free podcast or the daily devotion emails all the way to an Advent or Lent devotional book. But at the real heartbeat of Blessed Is She is Jenna Gizar's call for prayer and community. And she so deeply desires Catholic women to be invited into this. She, she started Blessed Is She because she looked around and thought, gosh, my Protestant sisters have all these amazing Bible studies and all the groups. And my parish has got nothing going on for me, a working mom. Like, I, I can start something because I'm, I'm, she's working. She has little kids like where, where is the offering for Catholic women to be invited into prayer and community? So while we do have certainly, you know, all the social media sites and the Facebook groups, it's our hope that women can meet each other in person to, to go through our free stuff or to go through one of our books, but to truly meet other Catholic women from different ages and stages and to grow in their faith together through relationship, through story, through sharing their, their conversions, their how, you know, the Lord's worked in their life and is weaving their story. So in particular, this made new book came out, it did come out, gosh, end of last year. So we're still in the first year of it's, it's still, it's still a toddler. It's still a baby, Rachel. It's still a baby book. It's not even a toddler yet. Uh, we were approached by Harper Collins Publishing to do a collaboration with them, which was really a joy. We've been putting out Advent and Lent devotional books for many, many years now to many, many women. And they're always a, an assortment of our, of our writing team, of our devotional writers, sharing their stories on whatever the theme is for that year with beautiful questions by our, our wonderful director of ministry advancement, Beth Davis. And it's a wonderful collaboration from our team to put these books together. So Harper Collins said, hey, you guys are doing something really cool over there. And we don't have a lot of Catholic books. We don't work with a lot of Catholic authors in our Christian book publishing division. So what do you say? You want to put some things together? Give us some proposals. So we whipped up, I don't know, I think we had like five book ideas and they liked 
they liked a few of them. So we jumped in and, and five writers just wrote our little hearts out, myself included, and shared it's a book about identity and these different five different ways that we experience God reinforcing that identity again and again. You are my beloved. You are my daughter. You're made my image and likeness. You're not, you, you belong. You have a place. You are mine. You are, you are part of this family of the church. So it, it was a joy to put together. And my own particular role is as man and e- managing editor, man and e- editor, managing <laughs> editor, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, as managing editor is to do everything from the littlest copy edit all the way up to, uh, you know, scaffolding out, taking a concept, working from like the concept, going through Google Docs with each writer, going through word counts, uh, you know, fleshing out themes, holding, holding their hand. I feel like I'm really a story doula. So it's my joy to conduct the choir of voices, you know, to like pull out that soprano a little bit. Oh, there's the baritone, you know, to, to have this cacophony of, of story being able to be birthed into the world. Gosh, there's like two things. There's like an orchestra and a birth. Sorry, guys. I just kind of <laughs> portmanteau those together there for you. So, so I get to work with, we have an incredible theological editor, Susanna Spencer. She's her master's from Steubenville theology. She's rock solid. So she looks at, looks through everything. She looks through it, you know, from the idea stage and it's like, Hey guys, tweak it this way. Um, and then I get to work with the writers all the way through Then I help manage the marketing and how, how we present the book and how we, you know, write the copy of product description and just work with an awesome team. We have such a great team of staff at Blessed She. Um, and then of course our 40 writers who are just 40 of my best people in the whole wide world. I love them. They're like my family. So I guess it's a little of this, a little of that, Rachel, sometimes, you know, making sure there's like some, you know some diapers sent to a writer and a new new baby or flowers sent to a writer who had a tragedy and um, getting in the Google Docs, color coordinating things and, and helping them tell and share their stories. It's so beautiful. I love it. Oh, I, and Made New just sounds, I love that it's all about identity and, and how that ties into our conversation so much and how that yeah. theme has been something the Lord has been putting on your heart and your story through the beginning and how he continues to kind of strip away anything that's coming in the way of your identity in him first. Um, And I think that's something that so many women and and just men and people in general, we struggle to come to understand our identity because it's so Mm -hmm. hard to even grasp in our heads, you know, that yeah, it's like such a simple concept and yet it's so impossible to understand that yes. it really is just love, you know, when it comes mm-hmm. down to it, just this dependence, total dependence on the one that willed us from the very beginning mm-hmm. and knows us better than we can even know ourselves. And just yeah. like we've heard throughout your journey, he is able to peel our layers when we're not able to peel them ourselves. (laughs) So all we can do is ask like you did when you had that moment of surrender. Mm. All we can do is ask him to show us and ask him to continue to peel away so that we can Mm. come to know our truest identity because that is what ultimately is going to help us to grow in who who we are made to become. And he knows that. And we, you know, So that sounds like a beautiful, beautiful project. Do you want to share just a little bit before we move on to questions? Um, But just what has the journey been like at Blessed Is She? Because you saw it from its infancy. And then I imagine you grew with it and grew as an editor over time into this role where you're now producing books like these. You know, it's amazing when you don't start with a, any preconceived notions. And Jenna Geezer just said yes. And she continues to say yes every day. She has six of her own kiddos. Mm. She and her husband work so hard to make everything happen. It blesses she. And every day, every day is a new leap of faith, a new yes. So to see where God's taking us has required a lot of spiritual growth personally. So I, I can't I can't say like, hey, I'm going to make an, an amazing marketing plan for our Advent book. I'm just going to come up with it if I haven't spent time in prayer that day. Mm. I mean, I, I could come up with something that's not going to be that great. And it's going to have a lot of Nell ego in it. And I want to disappear more. And I want to have God more present in my work. So 
as a team, we, we try to get to daily mass at least once or twice a week. As a staff, we do a daily mass and a holy hour once a week and pray the rosary and, you know, like have spiritual direction, like that there's a lot of being available to the Lord and placing him front and center. You know, Mother Teresa told, I think it was like a cardiovascular surgeon who came to tour and she said, oh, you know, like, do you pray a holy hour? He's like, I don't have, I'm not mother, I don't have time for a holy hour. And she's like, oh, that means you need two. And I, I think about that often when I think, oh my gosh, I just got the kids down. I have a couple hours ahead of me and <gasps> I got to start typing as fast as I can. And I think I, I actually have to pray first. Mm. I have to pray first because if we're not coming from a place of prayer, it's, I mean, it's already just straw, like St. Thomas Aquinas says, right? If his work is straw, ours is like, I don't know, ant hill scraps, like it's so <laughs> yeah. low. It's so humble. But if it's not infused with our Lord and it's not coming from him and what he desires, we're just that little pencil like St. Teresa, like those little pencil in his hand. So uh, it's been incredible to see so much growth in detachment and in humility for me coming in thinking like, oh, I know how to do this. And eight years later thinking, well, yeah, I mean, I certainly have skills and they've been honed throughout the years. You feel very confident, you know, working with a major publishing house was like, hey, here's a manuscript. It's ready to be proofread. Um, instead of like, oh, I don't know. Like, no, we've done this a lot. We know how to tell stories. We know how to write books. Go ahead, proofread it. Sign on to design. We're good to go. And not coming from a place of hubris on it, but truly like, oh, this is the reality. We're, we have a really well-oiled machine here. We know how to do story. We know how to help people tell their story, invite people into story, but also so many opportunities for me to say, hey, you know, I, I really advocated hard for this project or something to go this way. And because I'm part of a collaborative leadership team and, and staff, like, I don't always get my way. And especially as a mom, I think as a mom, you're like the queen of your own empire. And then when you <laughs> are also working, you're like, oh, collaboration, like detachment. I, it didn't, it didn't end up being the way that I thought it would be. And that's actually really okay. Mm -hmm. And it means that there's a lesson here for me. Maybe it's a lesson in humility. Maybe this, like, this is what the Lord wants instead. Maybe this is going to crash and burn. It doesn't really matter because I, this isn't all about me and imposing my will on others and getting it done because I already have to do that with my kids. Get your shoes on. Go potty. Wash your hands. Stop hitting your brother. Um, so to work with women in collaboration where we're figuring it out together to do it with one another is, is such an incredible gift. Rachel, I'm so sorry. You froze again. I don't know if I'm frozen, you guys. I should click out and come back in. Can you hear me, Rachel? Send smoke signals. Send a carrier pigeon. Okay. I'm going to click out and come back. Oh, you can hear me. Great. I can't hear you, but I will click out. And I'll come right back, you guys. Hi guys, thanks for joining. We're going to take your questions in just a minute. So if you want to pop any questions that you have for Nell into the chat right now, Nell will take your questions in just a second. Hello, Nell. Welcome back again. We even so prayed sorry, for this. Hello. Satan's the worst. He just stinks. <laughs> Technological issues. It's okay. It happens. We do it live so our audience understands live Anything can happen when we're going live, okay? So that's just okay. the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the last question I like to ask before we get to um, audience questions is, can you share with us one scripture verse that is either speaking to you recently or that has played a foundational role in your journey and why? Hmm. I just, I really love the woman at the well. I really mm. love that passage in St. John. And I feel like I've made so many mistakes in my life and, the Lord's called me out and called me on and called me on to bring other people to him, not pretending I'm not who I am with all my sinfulness and all my, my baggage, but he's asked me specifically to, to help bring people back to him, which is uh, such a gift to do that through Blessed Is She, but also in like off, off screen life as well, that to not be caught up in my, um, I think we can get so trapped and like, oh, I'm, I stink. I just, I'm not good enough. Why would God pick me? Like, well, he's calling all of us to go out and share the good news. So I, I really love that scripture. It really speaks to me. I love that scripture too. Oh, this is so good. And yeah, I just feel as a woman too, just so personally connected to that scripture and that call. Because I really feel like as women, we have just innate, natural strengths to be able to do that in a way. 
um, to relate to others and bring them into relationship with Christ or invite them into it. Um, And so uh, I love it. It's so good. All right. Let's see. We have a couple questions in the chat. So we will take those for now. Now, if you're watching live and you have any other questions for us, pop them into the live chat and we will take them. All right. So I see one here from Patrick. It says, how St. Joseph can have an impact? How can St. Joseph have impact in Catholic women's lives? Oh, what a great question, Patrick. Great I, question. I love St. Joseph. I feel like he's really understated, right? Like we just had the year of Joseph. Thanks be to God. This great reminder of the protector and an example of what a, what a real man does. He lays down his life for his family and how St. Joseph did that so beautifully. So I think to the impact of St. Joseph is to let women know like you you – you can expect more from the men in your life. I'm not just talking about, you know, the romantic relationships, but from your, your brother, your cousins, your male friends, your dad, your uncle, um, your male neighbor, like to, to call them on to, to embracing their, their, um, like the beauty of their masculinity, that it's actually, Mm -hmm. he was so receptive. Think of him like receiving the angel in those dreams and, and listening to the promptings of the spirit that that's true masculinity at its best. So I think it, it gives encouragement and courage to women to to invite the men in their life and to trust that that, that is a standard that we should hold people to and um, that it's possible. Of course, he was a saint married to Mary, foster father of Jesus. But hey, with God, all things are possible. Yes, that's so beautiful. And I love that question too because you don't normally think of that when you think of St. Joseph. You know, he's so normally tied to men and their own spiritual development. But I love thinking about how we can learn from one another and have an impact on each other like that. All right, we have another one here. Who is the biggest saint that has played the greatest impact in your life? So which saint for you and your story has had the most impact? Mm-hmm. I, I really love St. Therese was too. I feel like that can be kind of a Catholic cliche, but I, I read Story of a Soul. I was working in Strasbourg between my second and third years of law school for the summer. I read Story of a Soul. I spent a week in Paris. Um, just I didn't get to go to Lisieux, but just really felt her presence with roses and you know other little things. And then my husband has a first-class relic of St. Therese and – I was like, I'll marry you, but really it's just for the relic. I mean, it's just for Therese. Like, it's a great dowry. Bring her on in. Bring her to the family. Bring her to the home. So I do love her. One prayer that a friend of his, a priest friend of his, used to always say, little flower, show your power, which I'd never heard that prayer for St. Therese. But if I'm having a hard time, I'll just say like, oh, little, little flower, show your power. And she does. She shows up all the time in so many little ways with this 24-year-old French Carmelite, who died a long time ago, I mean, not that long compared to the canon of saints, but you know, long enough ago, who's a doctor of the church. She just, she rocks my world. She keeps me, she keeps me on the straight and narrow. Also She's have the relic so good. in the kitchen. So when I'm really tempted to wow. like lose it, I just look, I'm like, okay, show your power. I'm going to be kind to the kids right now. That cool. is incredible. Cool I'm going to do the dishes even though I don't feel like it. She's so great. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Even the fact that you have that I feel like is clearly a sign that she's she's interceding for you, and yeah, she's had such a so. huge impact on my my own journey. She's mm-hmm. so alive. She's just so, you know. If there's a, ever a saint, yeah, that you just want to, she was the first one that I ever asked to for intercession, and she Rachel. just started showing up, like you were saying, yeah. like she just is so tangible in ha- mm-hmm. in the graces. I think that the Lord allows, like her to intercede through and just show through in, in people's lives. Like it's very tangible in a sense. And I love that about, about her. And even when she was alive, she said, I'll spend my time, you know, yeah, I'll be busy. showing up for people. Yeah. <laughs> on earth. <laughs> the other just, side, yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. I love it. All right. We have one last question here that says another one from Patrick. Thank you, Patrick for watching. And he says, have you ever been drawn to a religious life? If so, how did that discernment go? You know, Patrick, it's actually tied with St. Therese. Uh, that summer I was in in France just thinking like, gosh, is this for me? And I kept thinking, I just don't know if I could take a vow of obedience. 
I'm just so stubborn. I don't know, Lord. Like if if I'm supposed to, you gotta you gotta really reveal that. And the only sisters and nuns I knew growing up were they, they're like older, a little crabby, kind of pinch like the back of your <laughs> arm, you know. And now uh, at our parochial school, we have Dominicans, the Ann Arbor Dominicans, who are fantastic. My kids and I were just over at the Missionaries of Charity in Minneapolis. They're like so many incredible sisters in our lives who are rock stars and awesome. So we have two girls and I, I pray for their vocations all the time. I'd be so overjoyed if they were called to the religious life. It's such an incredible journey for sure. But yeah, I, I'm too, st- I'm too stubborn, Patrick. The Lord needed to like sandpaper me in other ways. The vocation of marriage has helped. Yes. Clearly marriage and motherhood he's used, you know, so, um, yeah, he knows what we need. Like we've been saying yeah. before, we even know what, what it is that we need. But um, I thought it was a good, interesting question for sure. Yeah. All right. Now, thank you so much for joining us and sharing so vulnerably your own journey to where – how you came to know God and where you are today. Um, where can people go to find Made New or find you or find Blessed Is She? Are there any links or profiles they can go to connect Guys, just head to blessedishe.net. You'll see everything you need there. You can get us on Pinterest, Twitter. Ooh, Catholic Twitter, guys. It's a dumpster fire, but we're there. We're a light <laughs> in the darkness. Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook. We have regional Facebook groups. I think over 50,000 women at this point in regional Facebook groups all over the world wow. to connect. Um, certainly Instagram. It's my favorite place to hang out when I'm trying to be distracted from my duties. So, yeah, please come find us. Uh, made news available on our website as well, blessedishe.net slash shop. There's lots of great stuff there. Subscribe to the free daily emails. We would just love to have you join the sisterhood. Amen. Thank you, Nell. And thank you for all that you do and all the ways that you serve. Um, just such a beautiful conversion journey of coming to know the Lord's love and your identity in him. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you, Rachel. What a beautiful thing you're doing here. I'm so grateful to be part of it. But wow, you're you're building the kingdom, my friend. Keep oh, going. Thank you. Thank you so much. You too. You as well. So let's stay in touch and pray for each other. And yeah, yeah send me your intentions because I am also going to sure. daily mass <laughs> regularly because I know I need it. So um, Amen. yes. Thank you so much, Nell. I hope you have a good night. Thank you. You too, my friend. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, friends. Um, what a beautiful journey and what a beautiful soul. I feel like I I just love these stories. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but after it's like you get to just soak in the graces of their story and what a beautiful gift each one of our stories are. You know, it, like Nell was saying, it's all we have. I thought that was so powerful. And as she was saying that, it felt like, I don't know, it just rang so clearly in my head that our stories are a gift from God that he gives us um, to then be able to share with others. And when we share our stories or when we listen to someone's story, it does something really powerful for us in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, but also just, I think, spiritually, there is this special grace that God is giving of that person that unique journey that they've had coming to know the Lord. Um, And so I hope that you feel that same way. I usually feel that same way after every one of our conversations. Um, And I pray that this one helps you to grow closer to God in, in some way. Thank you so much for being here, friend. I hope that you will join the email list at togrowgood.com. Follow us on Instagram at togrowgood. You can also join our little community. We have a little community of supporters here that help offset the cost to run the show, film the show, have an email platform, have a website. All of those things have monthly costs associated. So if you're interested in supporting this mission and helping it to grow and expand wherever God wants this to go, you can go to patreon.com slash to grow good. And at each giving level, there are different gifts that you get on a monthly basis. Um, There's also bonus episodes that I do every month where we dive into scripture together and I share a little bit about what the Lord's doing in my life and what the Holy Spirit is putting on my heart um, as we go through different gospels and books of the Bible together. So if you're interested in joining us for a monthly scripture study, 
head on over to patreon.com slash to grow good and support this mission at the same time. Thank you so much for being here. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, wherever you're listening or watching, whether you watch during the stream now or whether you listen or watch after. Hit subscribe and yeah, just join us in this mission as the Lord continues to um, expand and grow, to grow good and wherever this is going next. And lastly, pray. Pray for the show. Pray for all the listeners and all the guests that will come on in the future and that have been on in the past. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great night. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of To Grow Good. There are a number of ways you can support this mission. Follow us on Instagram at to grow good. Join the email list at togrowgood.com for free weekly devotions written by Catholic women, a monthly newsletter with the most impactful content along my journey home to the church, and a notification each time we upload a new episode. Share this episode with a friend, a family member, a loved one, or a coworker. Leave a written review on Apple Podcasts to help refer the show to others who might be seeking. And you can pray. Pray for this show to reach the souls that God wishes for it to reach. If you are praying for To Grow Good, please be sure to reach out and let me know at togrowgoodpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, you can help to cover the financial cost to create and produce this show. For as little as one ice latte a month, you could join our little community here at To Grow Good, the branches of the vine. In exchange for monthly bonus episodes, gifts from the To Grow Good shop, and more. You can learn more by visiting patreon.com slash to grow good. Thank you so much for being here, friend, and I will see you next time.